Okay, my name is Fahad Aziz, and uh, I'm one of the charter members of Open Silicon Valley. This event is organized uh, in collaboration with two organizations. One is Open Silicon Valley, and the other one is APNA. And uh, this is one of, one of the first, uh, first events that we are doing together. So we are super excited about it. Uh, before we get started, I just want to thank uh, Pillsbury Law Firm for uh, providing us this uh, awesome venue to host this event. So without further ado, I want to ask my co-host, uh, uh, Fawaz Hassan, to uh, talk to, uh, tell us about the program and uh, introduce the keynote. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to echo Fahad and welcoming everyone uh, uh, during the JPM week. I know it's a busy week for a lot of you guys here. So thank you for taking some time and being here uh, on a Sunday evening, not a Friday. Uh, I'm actually excited about today's program. Uh, first of all, uh, quickly, um, I come with the, you know, close to 25 plus years in, in biotech sector. Um, but I've been associated with Open. Uh, I, in fact, I started, I think the first meeting back in 2004, and Mazam, I remember this, it was at a SAP in Palo Alto. Um, but since it disappeared, biotech, healthcare wasn't really quite the focus at that time. Um, and uh, it's pretty exciting to see that all of a sudden now Open is embracing healthcare and, uh, and biotech and, and uh, life sciences in general. Uh, I joined as CM charter member in 2019, and since then we've been pretty active doing quite a few events where healthcare and biotech and life sciences has been sort of the center of uh, a lot of these uh, new upcoming research, and especially in, uh, through the open network, uh, some of the diaspora that we have who have been involved in this sector for a long period of time, we want to give them a place, a center where they can come and interact and really uh, advance um, some of the uh, common things that we all are working on. Um, so with that, um, uh, I'd like to bring in our keynote speaker, uh, who's someone we in the industry know very well. Um, a lot of people don't know that uh, uh, there's this uh, National Institute of Standard and Technology, uh, which is a government institute and uh, does a lot of work, underappreciated, um, and Dr. Khan, who's going to be speaking today, is actually a chair of that. Uh, previously, he was at Takeda, where he was the global president of research and technology. Uh, he then joined PepsiCo under Indra Nuri uh, as a vice chair and the uh, head of R&D there. And a lot of progress was made during that time. Uh, since then, he's got a, a new life ahead of him. He's doing some exciting stuff, and I don't want to steal the thunder from that. Um, uh, especially when it comes to aging and, and, and life science around this. Uh, I'm going to have him talk about it, but uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mahmoud Khan to come and give a talk today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back in San Francisco. Um, it's been a, I think other than my visits to Stanford relatively recently, it's been about three or four years, partly COVID, partly us people on the East Coast don't get that far across the West Coast that often and probably need to be more often. Um, I'm going to talk about two or three things, and then I'll just leave it open for questions and see what you're interested in hearing about. Um, I've had four careers. Started off practicing medicine at the Mayo Clinic. I'm an endocrinologist originally. Went from there to pharmaceuticals. Uh, what I, most people don't know is before I became an endocrinologist, I was also trained in food science at the College of Agriculture the University of Minnesota. So I bridged medicine and food. Went to Takeda and then to PepsiCo, as you heard. Um, and now run a research foundation and a venture capital fund, and I'll talk more about the work we're doing there. A few comments for those of you who are entrepreneurs or in the life sciences space or are interested in getting into the life sciences space. You'll hear a lot of people talk about doom and gloom right now. You know, it, there's a, it, the number changes every day. There's 150 companies available at cash value in hand. Some days I hear 120, and some days I, it's 100. You know, you'll hear all of that. I've been in my career exactly 40 years. And I can assure you that every decade or so, you're going to have this doom and gloom and things are really bad, challenging. That's true, but they pass. And real entrepreneurship, whether it's small business or large business, is actually seeing through that challenge 
and riding it out until you get to the other side of this. So if anybody suggests or makes you feel like throw it in or get distracted, I can assure you. Whether you look back at the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, 2000s every decade there's one of these small down cycles. But the one thing I know is there are a few industries that are going to survive. Health, food and agriculture, transportation, infrastructure, and communications. Okay? Those, one way or another, are going to survive. We hear about this hyper-growth, this rapid acceleration. Trust me, uh, when I came out of high school, we were not allowed to use a calculator in our exams. I'm of the generation that took my junior college exams using a slide rule, and that was technology. I still have my slide rule sitting on my desk because in my last job I had 3,000 PhDs work for me, and they were all uber smart, all smarter than I was, and all telling me about the latest toy, the latest technology, the latest AI. My generation, the latest AI was Excel spreadsheet when Microsoft came out with it on a floppy disk. That was AI. And then AI, new versions came and new versions came, and we all think that that is the revolutionary next tool that's going to change everything. The reality of it is, and I say this having been chief technology officer twice of two Fortune 50 companies, the reality of it is, is the human mind that asks the questions that changes things. It has not changed. And I'll talk a little bit about now as an investor when I ask about technology what I'm really interested in. It isn't the toy. It's the questions it, it helps you answer. And those questions are what drive this, okay? So take the context of my comments in that way. It's a great time to be in this field, regardless of where you're coming at it, okay? What is different and is talked about is that for decades, if not for centuries, we've trained biologists and we've trained mathematicians and engineers. And in fact, if you go back, in your teens often, in my generation, it was in your teens you decided whether you're going to study mathematics or biology. And that was the choice. However, that is no longer the case. And that's good. Because we're actually seeing mathematicians becoming biologists and biologists actually behaving as mathematicians. And with that intersection has come a new rapid acceleration at the juncture of these two fields. That's what's different. Yeah, the tools have got faster, better, they can store more data, they can do more computations. But you can do a gazillion computations if you're not asking the right question, it doesn't really matter what you're computing. And that's really what has changed. Now let me elaborate a little bit and talk about why I'm doing what I'm doing and how we think this is critical. So as my wife will tell you, and my children will tell you, and I'm blessed with five grandchildren at this point in my life, I actually retired for 72 hours. I retired on a Friday, and my wife tells me it was 48 of those hours were weekend, so they don't count. And then Monday I was back as CEO again. And what really changed my mind about this was the challenge of healthcare everywhere in the world. We think the next rare disease is going to have this huge impact or the next rare cancer is going to have this impact. And I say this and as a clinician, we want to treat every single patient. We want to save every single life. There's no question there. But health systems are about taking care of large populations and having large impact. And the problem in healthcare today is our systems are failing. It's not the technology that's failing. Let me explain that a bit. Let's start outside the US. If you pick up the paper today or Google, the UK NHS most recently is estimating about 100 to 200 people are dying each month because of wait times 
not even getting into the emergency room. We look at Germany and the European Union and Germany as one of the best. Google Germany's health system today. Just Google it and you'll see that by any criteria, the, the German health system is collapsing. Okay? So before we think it's just the US and Medicare and everything else, even in so-called national health systems, the UK and Germany are cited as the best, their system is literally collapsing. That's not me quoting it, that's, you can just look at it. And there's a lot of discussion as to what happened. There's a couple of things that happened. One is, we've had pandemics, increased demand, but behind that increased demand was a decades-long decline in capacity of the health system to absorb any shock because of underinvestment. Why has the demand really gone up? that much. Now, if you look at the UK, US, look at Medicare's budget. Okay? About half or so, if not more, of Medicare's budget is age-related diseases. If you look at the, the largest health system in the United States, the veterans VA health system, it's almost all age-related diseases. It's the veterans. Okay? What we as society have failed to predict or didn't appreciate and listen to over the last two decades is this coming demand of our health system based on our current approach to medicine. This is going to have dramatic impacts on biotech, on pharma, on the providers, and the infrastructure. So I'll come back to how we think about this. I started thinking about this a little bit more deeply about three years ago. Some of you may have heard the name Victor Zhao. Victor is the current president of the National Academy of Medicine. He's been a mentor and friend of mine for a long time. We go back when he was at Harvard, I was at Mayo. And Victor called me and said we should have dinner in Washington. He called me about three years ago. And we had dinner and he said, Mahmoud, I want to have the Academy of Medicine the U.S. National Academy of Medicine launch a decade roadmap. They do this about once every 10 years. And I want you to join the writing team to write the roadmap. And we put together 12 commissioners from around the world, and we set about writing it. It was supposed to be a 12-month exercise. It took three years because of COVID. We couldn't meet. In fact, our first meeting was in Singapore in January of 2020 when COVID was announced as an entity. And so that slowed it down by about two years. It's a 250-page document. You can download it. It's actually, I think, the number two most downloaded document right now in the National Academy of Medicine. Take a look at it. As I said, I had the privilege of helping write it. A lot of the detail I'm going to talk about, you can just pick into there. But I'll give you some of the crib notes. Number one, this is the first time in human history there are more people over 65 on the planet than under the age of five. Just think of that statistic. Not the US. In the entire world today, there are more people 65 plus than under five. What's the implication of that? If you project the next 20 years, when these 60-something-year-olds become 80-something-year-olds, the 20-something to 30, 40-year-olds will not be equal in number. And in a global system, which is a pay-forward system, every country on the planet has a pay-forward system, and I'll explain that, there will not be enough people paying forward to take care of those older people. Does that make sense? You might think, well, in developing countries, there is no national system, they're still pay-forward systems, they're just involuntary. Their customs, their culture, you go to Pakistan, India, Africa, it's a pay-forward system. The young generation takes care of their parents, their grandparents. That works when the pyramid's like this. The pyramid has now become this, it's about to become that. Okay? A major part of the progress of medicine, and for those of you in biotech, has been the fact that our drugs have been able to keep people alive. 
whether it's drugs, it's stents, it's equipment, our diagnostics. And life expectancy has gone up from about 50 to about 70 something. It's about a 30 year increase in life expectancy over the last 60 years. Most of it was public health related, reduction in infant mortality, et cetera. More children live to become adults and then they live longer. Okay? Unfortunately, that 30 year expansion in life expectancy was accompanied by a 20 year period of illness. So on average now, the 70 something year old is living with almost two decades of disease. Chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, etc. The most expensive disease in the United States today is Alzheimer's. It is not cancer, it is not diabetes, it is not heart disease, it's Alzheimer's. And it's only just started. Now, if you now ask yourself in a health system why the systems are collapsing, you start to put the pieces together. There are more people who are older, they're sicker, they're living for two decades with that. All of that is requiring a number of things. One is medical care, social care, but also family care. It is having an impact on employment. Two thirds to three quarters of the time, it's a woman who takes care of the family member. They're dropping out of the workforce, they can't continue their careers. It's a very gender bias system. It's either the daughter or the daughter-in-law is taking care of the parents. Okay? This is true globally. Accompanying all of this has been a dramatic, understandable, and many would argue uh, welcome decrease in birth rate. We've been talking about the global population as sort of exponentially rising. That's not the case. It's starting to plateau off. In most developed countries, the birth rate is somewhere between two and two and a half. Those of you not statisticians, the replacement rate is about 2.17 to 2.2. So when the birth rate per couple falls below 2.2, you're starting to get to stable populations. When you go down to 2.1, the population starts to decline. In Japan, 40% of adults, uh, sorry, 40% of the population now over 65. Almost half. China is the same. Scandinavia, it's the same. So the older populations are at a situation where somewhere between a third and a half of the population are already retirees and over 65. The economic impact of that is massive because the taxpayers are that young population, the 60% that are under 65 aren't all working age. The economics doesn't add up. So if the economics do doesn't add up, you can't actually support a health system because the taxpayers are supposed to support it. Does this make sense? So I wanted to give you this context because we've really, really not appreciated the macro changes. We jump in very rapidly into the deep this is what I want to change. And really, if you don't think of the macro, then you really don't understand where the tide is moving. Now, from a business opportunity, which I'll talk about, you do not appreciate where capital is going to move. So I'm giving you an indication that this is not lost on decision makers. Now, people like me are in macro jobs. We look at where these trends are and where should we take our resources. Large corporations, governments, uh, and with that, government resources come massive investments from national wealth. I don't care how big a company you are, you're nothing in comparison to national wealth, okay? So as mentioned, I'm chairman of the committee for the U.S. Committee of Advanced Technologies that oversees NIST, the National Lab. I actually chair that. Now, for those of you who are Muslim, very few people realize it's a Muslim who's the chairman of the U.S. Federal Committee on Advanced Technologies. NIST has a broad mandate, by the way, not just health, but every aspect. In fact, if you, those of you who are in IT, the U.S. CHIPS Act is being overseen by NIST and therefore my committee. Lori, the Undersecretary of Commerce, is the current 
director of NIST. Even at that level now, the government is asking themselves, where is this coming? Now on the pricing side, let me just mention, you, you saw this announcement of a new Alzheimer's drug being approved. You saw the same company had one previously. There was another one. What got lost is the last drug that was launched failed, not technically necessarily, because, but because Medicare refused to pay for it. It's been a, the current one is approved, but Medicare has not approved to pay for it. That is landmark. Why? Because governments, no matter how big and wealthy, including the U.S., are starting to ask the question, at what price? When resources are finite, when the population pyramid goes from this to this, you cannot just say, we're going to treat a few hundred thousand dollars per patient for a few months or for a year and assume the society will pay for it. That has been the assumption of this industry. That's been the assumption of medical care. If I prescribe it, it will get... Now, Europe started that first. If you go to the UK, there's a, a, a government entity called NICE. A, a farmer li likes to call it not so nice. And NICE looks at the economic impact of every drug and says, is this there? They've already gone to, so if you think of an example of IVF, we used to pay in the UK for IVF cycles, right? They don't pay for IVF cycles anymore. They pay for successful embryos. They say basically you can give as many cycles or as few cycles as you want. Uh, if you have a successful embryo, you get paid. If you don't, you don't get paid. That is the ultimate pay for performance. Yes. Right? Yes. So this is a government policy, not in a third world. This is the United Kingdom, arguably the best integrated national health system in, in the world. Europe is going through the same. When will it come to the U.S.? That's just a matter of debate and time. But you're seeing the first indications of it by the fact that an Alzheimer's drug got approved but didn't get approved for reimbursement. Because who's going to get Alzheimer's? It's the Medicare patients, right? It's not private insurance. This is a government decision. So park that for a second. So those are parts of the challenge. Now let's talk about opportunity, okay? You understand the challenge. You understand the impact on the workforce. There are some societal implications of this for those of you looking for business opportunities. This city, and no city in this country, is designed for a population where one in five people are 65 to 85. The city is not designed for that. The sidewalks aren't, the buildings aren't, the lighting isn't, the architecture isn't, the transportation isn't. Our driving license system isn't. So there's going to be a huge impact on several aspects of our, of our infrastructure, transportation. Imagine airlines when a third of the, pop of the passengers traveling are now 65 to 85 year old. Getting them on the plane, getting them, you understand? So all of this is either a challenge or it's an entrepreneur's opportunity. Communication, trying to dial a cell phone when your vision is getting increasingly impaired, and that's a large population. A mundane thing like go down the shopping. Any of you have grandparents or parents over 65? Go down the shopping aisle in a grocery store and take a look at how many of the food packages your grandpa can open. That bag of chips, see if you can open it when you're 80. You understand what I mean? Let alone read the label. So multiple industries are now starting to ask this question, which is an opportunity, because it will mean transformation of these industries at the macro level. This is where entrepreneurs will come in. They'll say, OK, I know how to address this. And they'll get fixed. And capital will fund it, because the market's massive. There are a billion people on the planet over 60, and there will be 2 billion by the year 2050. There's a billion new consumers coming. And by the way, as a segment, they have the largest purchasing power of any part of the population. It's the boomers. They have more disposable income 
And we, we aim to spend it rather than give it on to the next generation. Because this boomer generation is spending their money. They're traveling. They're having vacations. So they're putting the cash back in. Make sense? Now, now let's talk about biology for a second. So I wanted to give you the non-biological. If you want to address aging as a biological phenomenon, you can come at it three broad categories. The key thing with aging at a biological level is the loss of resilience. It's the fundamental change. Older, as we get older, our ability to be resilient gradually declines. And we suddenly think, you know, my parent had a stroke, they had an accident, they had a pneumonia, and that was the cause of their demise. That's not the case. There was an underlying decline and an acute insult, which otherwise a normal, healthy person would have recovered. A young person recovers. They don't recover to the same baseline and eventually get to the point where they don't recover at all. Okay? That loss of resilience is the fundamental hallmark of aging. It doesn't happen when you're 70. It happens when you're 30. Why do I say that? Your teenager gets an injury, get, bangs their knee, bangs their elbow. Monday morning, they're back at school. When you're 30, you feel it by the end of the week. When you're 50, you're still feeling it a couple of weeks later. When you're 70, you're complaining to your wife about it even three months later. What's the difference? The injury was the same. Do you understand? That is loss of biological resilience. That's the fundamental hallmark underlying all the other things. Now the question is, what can we do about it? Okay? As we age, there's a number of pathways. Some of you are biologists, some of you are not. I won't get into that, but I'm going to give you some simple examples. But let me start with the optimistic hope. We often get asked the question, so how do we address it? One is, you say, well, I can't change the function, but I can change the environment in which this individual lives. Okay? And we've just started to do that, change architecture, change the transportation system. I touched on that. That's one. And that will be a, a lot of entrepreneurship and investment will go in that. Essentially put it in the bucket of changing the environment in which we live. Okay? The second is the human environment interface. How we engage with the environment is through our senses. In fact, a fundamental part of aging is our senses start to diminish. Just think about it. And if you think that's old age, no. This is, I started when I was 30. Visual acuity starts to decline. We have an ophthalmologist. Not when you're 60, it's in your late 20s. Hearing starts to decline in your 30s and 40s. So these processes don't suddenly happen. We're all aging. We're all experiencing, and most of this room, if not everybody, has already experienced a degree of that aging process. Okay? So we can now supplement that function, either by wearing glasses, hearing aids, transportation device, something else that supplements our functionality and how we engage with the environment. The third category is that change the biology itself. Just think of that. Change the biology itself. There is a fourth, which we're starting to think about, which is can you change the biology using devices? That intersection. So it's sort of not the second. It's not really just the third. It's a bridge between those. I acknowledge it, but we can get into that debate. Okay? And there are, there's evidence that devices can change the biology. We get it. Not supplement it like a pair of eyeglasses, but actually change it. Now the question comes, can you actually change the biology? And I'm going to give you a couple of pieces of evidence that clearly suggest to us the biology can be changed. It's not permanent. The first one is something we've observed since the dawn of time, and we didn't quite appreciate what we were observing in nature. I say nature, some of you believe in God, some of you don't. I happen to, 
we'll say it was God. But let me give you a very basic biological example. If you take a woman who's, let's say, 30 years old, and you measure any of her cells, you can actually measure the biological age of those cells. There's lots of metabolic techniques and molecular techniques. You can measure the biological age. In fact, we're getting so good now that we can measure your biological age separate to your chronological age based on your date of birth. This has some major ethical issues. Because if we can measure your biological age very accurately, and therefore from that predict your life expectancy, who should have access to that information? And is that a requirement, for example, for health insurance or life insurance? Right? Just like any other risk factor. Just think of that. I won't even get into that. But it has profound implications for the insurance industry. Okay? So that we know we can do. So you take a 30-year-old woman and you take her cells, you can tell that they're 30 years old. In fact, if you measure the age of her ova, her eggs, they're about the age 30 as well. The eggs will age as her body ages. If you now take a, let's say, a husband who's 35, 40, whatever, and you measure the age of his sperms, it will correlate with his age. And now that couple conceives a child. Within hours of fertilization, the new embryo's age is zero. It reboots. We've sort of assumed that. What I've just said is very profound. We've always assumed that. We've never actually asked the question. Because if it wasn't true, then every generation would have an older and older biological child. And after a few generations, you'd have a very, very dysfunctional embryo, right? It's not the case. At the point of conception, within hours, the biological system can reset the age. Just think of that. It's profound that nature designed into its system a reboot mechanism so that every generation would start again. Understanding what that switch is and its mechanism is about as profound a biological intervention as we can imagine. So for those of you who think you're coming up with this next protein, think of that. You understand where I'm going? So that's the first piece of evidence that if you think of the observation, it has to be true. It's a question is not, is it true, but how is it happening? That's the first thing. By the way, in our bodies, we only have one set of cells that are immortal. And they are been immortal for thousands of years. They are your germ cells. They are the direct descendants and have are your germ cells, which is, if for, of course, your reproductive cells. So that's one piece of observation. The second observation is that if you actually take living cells, we've always assumed that once they differentiate, you can't de-differentiate them. But until Yamanaka came along, identify the Yamanaka factors. Those of you who are not biologists, he identified a set of proteins that actually can change a mature cell back undifferentiated. And he got the Nobel Prize for this. The problem is, if you undifferentiate a cell too far, it can become cancerous. So it tells us that cancer and oncogenesis is actually very closely related to aging as a biological process. It actually has similarities. And those things can be programmed and David Sinclair, who's at Harvard and one of the founding scientists of the company I remain chairman of, Life Biosciences, took three of the four Yamanaka factors, cut a long story short, identified, he took uh, old blind mice that couldn't see, put these factors on a virus, infected the eye, and showed that these mice could see again. This was published on the cover page of Nature a couple of years ago. <clears throat> I was CEO of the company at the time, and we raised a fair amount of money. 
it's going through Series C, etc. But I'm not talking about the company, but the fact is the technology has been proven in living organisms. It's now being repeated in primates, non-human primates. So it's gone from cellular organisms to rodents, now non-human primates, and you can imagine the next step. Now, before you get onto this and say, okay, so we're going to live forever, no. Every one of the things I've just showed you, told you about has restored function. There's no evidence that it actually restores longevity. The goal here is to live healthier as long as possible with function, not to live forever with dysfunction. No human being wants to live an extra decade to be living in a hospital. Right? As my father used to say, and may he rest in peace, he died in his 80s and he used to say, you know, I love my sons, but I never want to depend on you guys. And he was blessed in that way. He passed away. The only time he ever visited a hospital in his whole life was the day he died. Wow. He was 80-something years old, and that was his first day he was admitted to a hospital. He never stayed overnight. That's probably the, all of our goals, right? We don't want to depend on anybody. So let me finish by talking a little bit about evolution and why evolution came about. We are the largest now funder of the science and investment in the biology of this, and nobody's heard about us. And that was by design. So about three years ago, when I was working with the National Academies uh, as a commissioner on the report, we um, two sovereign funds. Uh, let, let me back off on the sovereign funds. We all think of large venture capital funds as the primary funders of biotech, right? Two-thirds of the world's venture funds today, two-thirds of the capital in all venture funds in life sciences comes from sovereign wealth. So I don't care which fund you're backed by, the odds are it is backed by sovereign wealth. Okay? So the two are not separate. The difference is sovereign wealth for the last 20 years has primarily been funding through other funds because it didn't have the expertise. In fact, in the early days, public investment fund, the Saudi sovereign wealth, Mubadala, the Emirati sovereign fund, these are by far the biggest. The Norwegian fund, those are three, these are the three big ones, have chosen to invest their funds through other funds and let the due diligence and evaluation and everything. In actual fact, the last 10 to 15 years, they've been gaining expertise on how to invest in technology. And what you're seeing in the last five years is that they started to become more face forward. And what you're going to see in the next five to 10 years is much more direct investment because they've built the capacity in the teams. All right, just to give you sort of the lay of the landscape. I'm not talking about a few billion dollars. We're talking about trillions of dollars. Right? Each of these funds is somewhere between half a trillion and a trillion dollars each. Okay? By far, the single source of capital. So the, uh, about three years ago, uh, two Middle East soft, sovereign funds, the Emiratis and the Saudis, came together and said, we want to launch a global initiative around uh, this whole field. Aging became the clear opportunity. I hope I've convinced you why. It wasn't a specific cancer. It wasn't a specific rare disease. Everybody says, oh, Middle East has lots of genetic disorders, so let's go after that. Uh, they were very smart. The big opportunity globally is diseases of large impact, which governments are going to be willing to pay. In fact, they're going to be wanting to pay for them. Okay. It is quite, you know, rare disease, disease investment is only a very recent phenomena. Why? Because governments protected the pricing and the regulatory path. And we got very expensive drugs for a few patients, which is important. We got great progress, but governments can undo that very quickly when they decide to shift if that's what they choose to do. They have to take care of a billion elderly people that are costing them. The U.S. is what? predicted now that 20% or so of our GDP will go to healthcare at this rate, right? We can't afford it. So, evolution was founded. Have you wondered where evolution? It's health evolution. 
And the goal was initially to create a venture capital fund and a research uh, funding source foundation. The USNIH has an institute called the National Institute of Aging. It spends about uh, $200 million a year on aging biology from that. Compare that to the budget of the NIH, which is 42 billion. Of that, a billion is, is aging. Of that, 200 million to 300 million is aging, aging biology. There's the mismatch. Medicare's budget is that aging. 200 out of 40 billion is the biology of aging in a billion. So somewhere around 2% of its budget is on actually the single biggest driver of our healthcare costs. And that's now being looked at and going, okay, this is not right, okay? So Evolution, we came, I actually helped design prior to launching it. It was pro bono, I was approached and said, you know, would you help us think this through? So I did, um, and we came together and said, look, Instead of launching a fund and a research foundation slash agency, we asked a question. Is, this, is the reason to invest capital, or is the reason to fund the research to progress the science? Absolutely. But I also recognize that when you fund science without providing capital to pull it through into the market, it sits as publications. In fact, most of the time, the only people benefiting are the scientists who publish the paper or file a patent, and nothing happens to it, okay? And so we need capital, couple, and that capital has to be different than the usual capital. Why? The usual capital, and I don't mean any disrespect, but I'm just, this is a general statement, is a 10-year fund, and you launch a fund, and you say, I'm gonna deploy capital for about three years, right? And then I'm gonna, at the end of it, take about three years to get the returns. So four to five years is actually the time on average I'm waiting to see if I get a return. Well, if you're gonna change, if you're gonna have an impact in most healthcare biology, it's not gonna happen in that time period. And so what happens is they start picking off the tail end and the pipeline continues to dry. And that's what's been happening. We've picked off everything. Government funded the, bar the start. VCs picked out the rest, pharma took it to market, and then there's this big gap in the middle, right? And that's where a lot of this is stuck. So we realized that needed to happen. So we had a discussion, we said, why not create a venture fund that doesn't have that same time commitment and put it within the foundation? And I'm not talking about a small amount of money as a social impact, no. Put the venture capital fund where the returns on the venture fund actually go back. And so now your return is measured not only as capital return, but actually impact. Hence our vision statement, go onto our website, is very clear. We are looking to expand healthy lifespan for the benefit of all. It's to democratize the technologies, not for a few. Which means we're not gonna invest in something that's gonna impact a couple of hundred people at a million dollars of treatment. Not interested. It's gotta have large scale impact across the world, okay? We launched um, publicly this year, and we have two verticals. One is we provide research grants anywhere in the world, and in this coming year, we're looking to deploy somewhere around $200 million. Our goal, and we're on track to be deploying $1 billion a year. About half of that initially is research funding and half is capital, and over time more and more will shift to capital because if we pull the ideas through, and at about a billion dollars a year capital and research funding purely in healthy and aging, we're by far the biggest. On an annual deployment, we're bigger than the Ford Foundation and second only to the Wellcome Trust. So, gives you an idea of our scale, okay? I have the privilege of being CEO of, of the parent entity within which comes the foundation, research arm, and the venture arm, 
each headed by either regional presidents and local. We operate in the Middle East. We have an office now in Boston. We're also a US LLC, as well as a 501c3. Our UK office will open this year, and our Asia office will open next year. So that will be our global footprint. We've got a very experienced board. You can go onto our website, take a look. You know my chairman. He's the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who I report to. And we are backed, as I said, by sovereign wealth for that reason, which means we want to drive this um, for the long term. A couple of comments on impact. The, I don't know of a single fund or a pharmaceutical company that would invest in a drug that's got a patent expired. I challenge any of you. I'm actually looking at a proposal to repurpose a patent expired drug to fund it, to actually reapply it for these, because there are thousands of molecules sitting with expired patents or soon to be expired patents that were developed for one reason. That didn't succeed, but we have failed to apply them. Now, before you think that's a dumb idea, let me remind you that the largest selling diabetes drug at one point used to be a drug that I was closely involved with, a Takeda, pioglitazone, or Actos. <coughs> that was a failed lipid drug. It was not developed as a diabetes drug to start with. It's a failed lipid drug. The only advantage it had is its patent still had a long enough life, so it was repurposed within a pharma company. Those of you who know Viagra will, may remember that Viagra was actually antihypertensive, that failed as a blood pressure drug, but succeeded as a uh, erectile dysfunctional drug. There are lots of those examples, and the best treatment today for leprosy is what? Thalidomide. What was thalidomide? It's a patent expired drug that was taken off the market because of its effects on the fetus, right? I can give you dozens of examples of repurposed very powerful drugs, but pharma won't fund them. Venture capital will not fund invest in them, which is a tragedy in our societal financial structure because the technical power possibilities are failing to be brought to market because government doesn't see it as its mandate. NIH won't give you a grant for it. VCs won't fund it. Pharma is not incentivized to do it, and they sit. And there's if we think about cellular senescence, analytics, if we think of why did these drugs. So part of our fund is actually being targeted specifically to evaluate and fund repurposing. Again, we're not looking for financial return on it. But these are drugs that could be one, three, five cents a pill, but could be game changing because we know their biology. A lot of investments already been made on the classes because of safety. So, in many, many ways, we've been set up by design to be very different. Let me stop there. Questions? So the example you gave, uh, gave us is really inspiring about repurposing drugs. So I guess, I guess a, a, my question would be that, would you, uh, would you consider finding a patent on these new drugs, or you just say, let's bring them to market without funding them? So we do not intend to bring anything to market ourselves. Okay. We're not a company by design. We're not an operating entity. We work through partnerships. That's by design. So I don't have a large team. I don't want a large team. You know, been there, done that. Every bit of research we're doing, wherever possible, we're actually funding universities. So we've already announced uh, there's the American Federation of Aging Research. Its last round, 50% of its grants came from us. Impetus grants, some of you look them up. Half of this last round of grants came from Hevolution. We are funding through universities. We're about to announce some endowed chairs, a whole variety of things. So we're not going to bring anything to market. My belief is, and there's good reason to believe, that if a patent expired drug was shown to be effective, there are plenty of generic companies who will manufacture it. Why patent it? The generics will pick it up in a heartbeat. Indian companies, Chinese companies, Israeli companies, European companies. Novartis makes generic drugs. They just don't have the incentive to get regulatory approval for them. We would do that. 
Okay, so that's one thing. The second is there is entrepreneurial activity because if I could show you, you know, everybody in my field talks about metformin. Should I be taking metformin because of, you know, as an anti-aging drug? It's very cheap. If we could show in a trial that metformin is effective in cellular biology, I can guarantee there'll be 100 people in this city and in Boston who will launch a better version of metformin in a trial. The entrepreneurial activity that will spur will be massive because you can say, this generic version does this, I can get you a better one than that, right? That's what biotech does. Okay, so this is good, this is even better. That will happen, those will get patented. I have no doubt. The key is what can I do to, as, a, as, a, as a leader? At this point in my career, I'm very much interested, how do I spark innovation in this, right? Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you so much, it's been really interesting. So you have this set of issues where you talked about this, the pyramid, the inversion of the pyramid, yeah. and the example of the Alzheimer's drugs that were expensive in the market. So when you have sort of changes at that macro level, society's assumptions of what you value or how you measure the impact of things, it can either be done piecemeal or there's some sort of setup of rules of what does it mean to, what is life, what is life expectancy? No. What is it, is, does that question make sense and how are we going to set up, because you need a playing field. To play, sure. Right? So when we were writing this, uh, Roadmap. One of the things, remember, this roadmap, it's a global roadmap, had representation from the UK, European Union, Switzerland, China, Hong Kong, Japan, Chile, North America, Australia. So this was not a US, even though the US National Academy led it, the commissioners made up all these countries. When we met, one of the deficiencies that became clear, because it's a typical group of uh, scientists, MDs, PhDs, etc., got together, and we realized there's no economist in the room. So a good friend of mine, former professor from Oxford and now at London Business School, is a guy called Andrew Scott. He's probably written, he's probably the top two contributors of thinking about the economics of aging in the broadest sense as an economist. I recommend take a look at some of his writings. He's coming up with another book on this. Um, we invited Andrew to the table. And we said, um, how would you think about it? Not as a sci physician or a scientist, but as an economist. And he contributed the economic discussion of that. The estimate in total economic impact is about $2 trillion for every 12 months of expansion of health. So you live the same if you, if you replace 12 months of this illness with 12 months of health, that's all, it's about two, it's two trillion dollars, okay? So the macroeconomic has actually been calculated. The question really is not a quantitative or academic or scientific. Who will have the political will to decide how to put value? It's an ethical question, right? It's an, it's an ethical, ethical question, right? But it's also a political question because if you go to your, you know, we criticize this, sitting here in the US, if you look at this and you say, well, you know, in the UK you don't get dialysis if you're over 65, or you don't get a kidney transplant. The UK, I mean, they're equally smart. They look at this and say, you know how many people, we, we, lives we save in the 40s, the younger population that has now got access to healthcare versus you in America where 30% of your population is not insured and is dying because of lack of healthcare, right? <laughs> so it's easy for us to quote one, without actually saying what's the population impact and why is our system any better than? In fact, at a population level, we've got one of the worst healthcare systems in the world. Take a look at our mortal infant mortality, take a look at our survival, our life expectancy in this country is actually declined again. Right? So that is being done. I can give you a whole dissertation on it. it's being done. It's not, it's gonna be an ethical, political question the technical part will be addressed, has, is being addressed. Question in the back. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. You definitely laid the case for the social and economic impact of aging. I guess the, the real question around that, uh, in the direction you're going with the foundation, um, is, the, is the thought there to drive down cost of healthcare as you move forward, focus more on treatment, focus on 
better access <clears throat> to ease aging? Yeah. What's the ultimate goal that you're, as you think through these things, yeah. very complex issues, what's the ultimate goal of bringing it together to make so, a change? Look, the ultimate goal is, as I said in our visions, expand health span. Expand the period of our life at the end, replace the illness with health. Now, behind that statement is where you're going, which is how do you target it? We're not there to change the economics. That's a government policy. I'm not, I'm giving you the argument of what's going on. I'm not saying that's what we're focused on. We're focusing on the science to bring to the market, not just fund the science, bring to the market and f be a catalyst to bring that to market. We're not gonna bring anything ourselves to the market. Be the catalyst to allow these technologies to come forward. How they get used and where they get used are policy and med the medical field. I've stopped practicing medicine when I went into this phase of my career. That's up to the medical profession to decide. What we identified is a gap, as I mentioned, of the funding to bring this forward. I'm a firm believer that between entrepreneurs, medical profession, policymakers, when the evidence starts to happen, they will follow. The question is, what will it take? Okay, that's what we're focused on. Yeah, because you, you kept worried that it would be more of the same. No, no. I'm not about to fund another treatment for type 2 diabetes, even though I'm an endocrinologist. So, so I guess my question slash comment may be slightly anti arm arrow, given what we're talking yeah. about. But what are your thoughts about just the prevention of it, given the fact that, I mean, the most obvious things before COVID, uh, you know, the highest risk to the next generation of living less than the previous is obesity. And the fact of, you know, the effect of just our diet and processed foods. So actually reversing that, trying to reverse childhood obesity with simple things like reintroducing whole foods, exercise, those things, which will probably have a pretty big and immediate impact on things that we don't, at least in my world, and I do work in the biotech world, uh, you know, talk about as much. Um. This is outdated now, but the Piro's textbook of pharmacology, three chap three editions of it, I wrote the chapter on obesity. Mm -hmm. I am very sensitized to it and all the rest of it. Um, most of the things I just talked about, about aging, has nothing to do with childhood obesity. The impact chronic disease in the last two decades of life are the 60 to 80 year olds. Childhood obesity is clearly a problem. It's a predictive of premature cardiovascular disease. Those are not the ones who are surviving. So let's put it into the context of if you're obese when you're 10, you're unlikely to be 80. Okay? So again, we have to put it in the context. The primary drivers of healthcare costs, as I mentioned, are indeed neurodegenerative diseases, metabolic diseases, not just obesity related, diseases like osteoporosis, musculoskeletal, arthritis, all of these things. Some of them have impact because of weight, but not all of them. Okay? So there's an underlying fundamental reason. Now the other part of this, which is always interesting, and in, again, I am a metabolic physician, Obesity, not all obese people become diabetic. Yeah. So there's clearly, obesity is a risk factor. It can't be the primary driver. If it was, there'd be 100%, it's not even 50%. And the fact that the majority of Americans are obese aren't diabetic tells you, and yet, Asians, and we can get into fat distribution and all the rest of it, but most of us in this room become diabetic way before we're obese. So it's not that simple. Uh, I would like, I love the conversation. I really appreciate the fact that you hit on the macro level, the macro, the macro topic for in healthcare. To me, healthcare is all macro, if you mm -hmm. want to get to it. One, one macro issue, it's probably more related to your work in NIST as opposed to uh, the foundation. But I rarely hear it mentioned uh, at a policy or at a national level. And we'd love to hear if this has been ever a topic of discussion. When I think about challenges in healthcare, all the things you mentioned are obviously very true. But if I think about the U.S. as a system, to me, it's labor cost. 60% of healthcare spending is on labor. And it's like, I'd argue it's the most inefficient industry other than hospitality, <laughs> right? And if you want to move the needle on anything, it's like, how do you make healthcare a more, uh, 
efficient industry in terms of human output. Yeah. But it's a tough one to deal with politically because right now I think we use healthcare to subsidize uh, employment. So, yeah. uh, what, where, where does the investment or the will to dramatically change uh, the productivity of the average healthcare worker? So, um, the changing in demographics of our population is actually having two major impact on labor. There are about a million manufacturing jobs in the country that are unfilled right now. It's one million at a macro level. It is predicted over the next decade, if we don't do anything different in the US, it will become two million. Two million manufacturing jobs, and in particular with small to medium-sized companies. So on the labor shortage side, the biggest challenge here is not only not enough workers, but not enough skilled workers. This country is not short of workers, it's short of skilled workers. That's been the biggest challenge. Part of that becomes our educational system, and there is a lot of discussion at NIST, because unlike the European educational system, we have failed to develop a skilled worker track. We basically say you're either a manual worker or you go to college. But vocational training in this country for the last few decades essentially has been ignored. That was okay when most manufacturing didn't require a lot of technical skills, but with automation and efficiencies came requirement for those skills and we don't have the system to do it. So there's a lot of discussion now in Washington how to change that. Let me park there. The two most, which of the two most advanced robotic development and manufacturing countries in the world? Japan, Japan and? Taiwan. South Korea. Okay. The most advanced. How did they start their robotics industry? Auto? No, it wasn't auto. Labor. Labor to do what? To help To work in hospitals. What was it? They were so short of basic manual workers in a hospital system, they started to invest in developing robots to help manage moving, assisting moving old patients. Remember, 40% of the population is over 65. Their hospitals are essentially geriatric hospitals. They didn't have, Japan had no immigration. And so how are you gonna find the, the, the nursing care to just move patients? So they went and started using what will develop robots. In fact, that's the genesis of their robotics. So they've already gone this down this line and they have become the most advanced robotics manufacturers, developers and manufacturers. Most of their output actually isn't going to healthcare. But the underlying reason they went into that was actually healthcare. And that's good business and entrepreneur. They, they looked at the opportunity, developed the technology, and identified new markets. But it started. The inefficiency in our system is not simply that. The inefficiency in the US system is the multiple layers of bureaucracy in processing. If you actually look at the overhead, the GNA, in taking care of a patient, it is huge. Uh, there's, uh, the government's trying to, to do this, and trying to address this, so some of this is historical, and I'm gonna give you a very quick history. How did, um, how did we end up? I mean, in this country, we have more CT scanners and MRI pieces of equipment per capita than anybody in the world. Why? Demand. I'm sorry? Physician-induced demand. No. No. I, I used to believe that when I was a physician. So Medicare was set up back when? 1960s? Yeah. Right? And when Medicare was launched, now think about this very carefully. When Medicare was launched, the government sat in Washington and said, well, you know, we're going to pay you to do an x-ray, a chest x-ray, right? Now, if you're in New York or Boston, you say, hey, hold on. My cost of doing an x-ray in Boston is much higher than doing it in Kansas City. Fair? 
So how are you going to cover my extra expenses versus the guy sitting in Wichita? And the government said in their wisdom, I'm not saying I had any better answer, but the government said, OK, fine. We will give you an adjustment for the cost of doing business in your city. Is that fair? That's fair. So how are you going to calculate cost? Well, they said, my cost of building this building is much more expensive in Boston than it is in Wichita. And they said, OK, well, we will give you your true cost of doing business. The accountants got a hold of that. And they said, ah, which means I can amortize my cost of capital as a cost of doing business. So capital expenditure became underwritten as a loan by the federal government. You just needed to raise your cost of capital, your cost of your infrastructure, and you would be guaranteed so long as your occupancy rate was high enough. Does that make sense? And so now the incentive was every small town built its own hospital, put its own MRI scanner, put its own CT scanner across the country, incentivized by a federal policy that said, whatever your real cost of business is, we will give you an allocation for that. Does that make sense? Just look at how it was done. That continued for a few decades. And these things mushroomed. Now that caused not only capital investment, because the government was paying for it, added bureaucracy to calculate all of this. All this came come to you. All this continued. Now, then came the wake-up call. When government said, hold on. Remember about 10, 15 years ago, we're going to start, start what started to happen. Small town hospitals started to close. They couldn't ma manage their finances. So all this entrepreneurial activity suddenly came to a halt because the rules got changed. But I just want to give you an insight that there's always, if you actually study this, you go into it, you start to realize what was actually not deliberately done as a bad thing. There was a historical reason. It's all, hindsight's always 2020. I tell this to young people every time they think, you know what, we're much smarter than your generation. No, at the time that made sense for that reason. We just have to study it to understand what was wrong in that decision in terms of its implementation? You, you had a question. Well, that, I was going to ask you how what's going to happen because of the rural hospital closure and yeah. how how is that going to economically? So the government essentially, as you know now, pivoted. ACI. Yeah. Right. You can't support all of that infrastructure suddenly because I'm not going to underwrite it anymore. Essentially, the government was underwriting a loan, right? So that started to change, but that's a challenge. COVID taught us that. The pendulum perhaps swung so far because we're not willing to pay for the inefficiency of maintaining capacity. And Germany and the UK, as I just mentioned, also suffered that, not just us. Yeah. So um, you mentioned uh, that about 20% of the national GDP is now healthcare. No, will be, I said. Or will be, or 18%. So it's, it's a huge proportion of the the, the national GDP. If you, uh, I think the, the, the problem is that when you uh, look at healthcare and the dollars that are spent in healthcare, a lot mm -hmm. of new companies like, for example, Google and Amazon want a piece of that pie. Yep. Of course, probably to make money or for whatever uh, high reason they Well, there are uh, companies in, in it to make money. That's okay. But when you look at the expenditure on healthcare and we say, do we, how much health we get out of it, when you think about it, Spending on healthcare is very, a very small proportion of the money that ultimately gets you health. So, for example, if you look at the social determinants of health, yeah. and if you look at the life course uh, theory of disease, of, that if a person is healthy today because of what his mother was or grandmother was in vitro, in, uh, in, in vitro, I think in vitro. Yeah. So don't you think uh, that's where most of the money should be spent? And is your company looking at that, looking at the social determinants, how much money they can spend there, rather than the more glamorous healthcare, drugs, molecules, devices? Because that's where the biggest bang of the buck will be for people's longevity, but not only longevity, but of the quality of life also in old age. Yeah, so two different facets. One is, for the one billion people who are already old, and another billion that are moving in, none of that's going to make any difference to them. So you can come at it with that approach. Say, I'm going to take care of young people, keep them healthy, prevent them from doing this. That may be true in 30, 40 years from now. That will be a healthy cohort. Assume your hypothesis is right. Correct? 
what do I do with the two billion people who are now either already old or getting old, and they're costing me 20% of my GDP? It's too late for me to go back and say, you should have changed your lifestyle 30 years ago. Okay? Mm -hmm. Seeing a patient with lung cancer and telling them we should have stopped smoking 30 years makes no difference to that patient now. And so we're really dealing with two issues. One is, what's the long term of those young population? What can we learn to th change things? But most doctors today are taking care of these sick older people. You go into a hospital and take a look at the average age of a patient in your inpatient unit. It isn't 30. So we still got to take care of them, and that's what's costing us the GDP. So those are two different things. We're focused on trying to have this impact on this age and soon-to-age population. That 40 to 65-year-old is the future massive challenge to healthcare. Hi. So thank you so much for the uh, your help. So I've been in this aging space for almost 10 years as an entrepreneur. I, I got the opportunity to spend uh, three months in a senior home. And while I was there, I saw the first time challenges of uh, older adults stopping family members. And I started my company uh, on those challenges and ran it for 10 years, so very close to this yep. space. Completely understand uh, some of the challenges that you mentioned. One of the things that you know, I personally observed, and so there's a lot of research about it too, is that when, uh, when you turn 70 or you're 60, 75, uh, if you have uh, something to look forward to every day, there's excitement in your life, there's a purpose in your life, uh, then you, you wake up uh, excited, you're doing, the, the, your lifestyle is the same yep. as it used to be 30, 40 years back. You don't have falls, you don't end up in the hospital, and so on. So when you look at this uh, age span and, and try to improve the quality of life in the last 10, 20, 30 years, is that also a consideration on how to improve the... Uh, and so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're not interested in policy-related or public health education initiatives, things like that. Uh, we're avoiding investing in robotics and assisting devices, things, et cetera. We're very much focused on the translational stuff. Not saying the others aren't important, but as a fund, you have to focus somewhere. Okay? Our hope is that if we're focused in this area, this will attract investment and we're already seeing that from a number of other like-minded investors who start to come in. I have already a third um, large entity wanting to get into the space. The, because we've deliberately set ourselves as a nonprofit, we're not competing with anybody. In fact, I've put down as one of my KPIs, if we invest a billion dollars a year, and 10 years from now, the field has tenfold and we now become 10%, I will celebrate. The goal is not to remain the biggest or the only one. The goal is to demonstrate and bring others to it because we've shown that this is a very fertile area. We're not competing with anybody. That's the key. I'm sensitive to time, so I'm going to suggest this and I'm looking to the organizers now. I can keep going, but would you like me to Call it a day. What would you like to do? I mean, there's like half a dozen. We can close with my comment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's take two. This gentleman, and then and then I'll wait around at the end for. Go ahead. Well, thank you so much for coming for a harrowing yet motivational conversation. Um, I was hoping you could comment on the quantified self. It's seeing some renewed interest. It kind of falls into category two or four that you were talking about, but. How much of it is hype? What's it doing right? Where is it falling short? Just your thoughts there. The honest answer is I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, and this is way outside my expertise. Um, I, am act I am actively recruiting. In the last 12 months, I added about 40 some people. I got about 100 more to fill this year. And just hired an ophthalmologist to join the team, hired a very seasoned physician venture capitalist. I'm now looking at a data scientist um, who's an expert in um, one version of AI, an MIT scientist. So we're building the expertise. This field is so fragmented, and it's a bit like an elephant. Everybody sees a different perspective of it, and everybody has 
not only that perspective, but think they think they have the answer as to this is the way to address it. None of them are wrong. I mean, you, you, in this discussion, we've heard lots of perspective. None of them are wrong. The issue is, where's the low-hanging fruit where we can have the biggest impact in the quickest time? And we can do everything, but one of the things I've learned in my 40-year career, if you don't focus you can, and don't land your first plane, you will not survive. And so I'm very, one thing I'm telling the team is, I will not let my team try and do everything. In fact, you know, the old man in the room is, is usually the, the thing in my executives now, and they're very seasoned executives. My head of investment, Bill Green, is a Yale-trained physician, internist, Harvard-trained epidemiologist. He was at Gates Foundation, Genentech. For those of you who know the biotech, he was at MPM Capital. He's the managing partner of MPM Capital. Spent 15 years there as a venture capitalist. Very seasoned. He knows if he comes into my office and says, oh, the team wants to do this, the usual answer is no. Because we're very clear. So I don't know. Can I find the right people? I'm of the generation, my son tells me there's a thing called the metaverse. And I go, what? I, I thought it was an equation. Right? And I'm, so now I've read this book on the metaverse. It's like, what the heck am I reading this stuff for? I don't know. I think we'll find the right people. And if the team convinces me, we'll go after it. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment. First of all, thank you for this talk. And I want to validate some of the things you've said. As a, Having worked as a frontline doctor in the nursing homes, I think this discrepancy that you pointed out between you know, the pyramid going this way and we're, we don't have enough young people to take care of these people who are getting older. And I've seen it you know, firsthand, and it's going to get worse. So we have to come up with solutions. Thank you for the so let me leave you with the fact that you've all know. COVID was about the elderly. 80% of the deaths were people over 65. Our inability to take care of the elderly our inability to support them through that acute illness and their lack of resilience was what shut down the world. Okay? Imagine the technology, and this is not Star Trek, this is feasible, the technology to be able to reboot your immune system such that not only can you recover from the, from the virus, but you can actually react to, positively to a vaccine. 40% of people over 65 who get a flu shot actually become immunized. 60% of people over 65 who get the vaccine for the flu do not have an adequate immune reaction. So the part of the population that needs it the most are actually the population that actually don't benefit from the vaccines, even the ones we have. If we continue just trying to get more and more vaccines without trying to change the biology of the immune system, nothing changes. You understand where I'm going? We have to invest not only in vaccine development, but the ability to enhance the immune system back to some normalcy in order for that immune reaction to happen in order for immunization to work, as simple as that, if we're going to prevent the next shutdown from another pandemic. That's why governments suddenly have woken up. And there's going to be massive investment getting behind this for that reason. Governments cannot afford to just now watch because the experiment has been done, right? The data is in. The question now is what policy, and that's what gives me optimism because there's a, a lot of funding will now follow this because every politician who wasn't a believer suddenly became a believer. Does that make sense? And for those of you as entrepreneurs, you know the old saying, go where the money is. I'll leave it with that. I'll take your question afterwards. Thank you very much.